this time, uh, we are going to move into the public comment portion of our meeting. Uh, staff has provided uh, a list of folks who have uh, signed up to make comments, um, and we are very appreciative of that. Um, the way that we are going to, to move forward is I will call um, three names at a time. I would ask that folks um, kind of put themselves on deck over by the podium so that um, we can keep things going. Um, based on the number of, of folks that we have signed up to comment, um, a comment uh, testimony will be limited to three minutes. Um, we'll be keeping uh, time here at the table and uh, when three minutes elapses, um, we will let folks know that. So the first three folks we have um, signed up, Eric Epstein, Margaret McCourt, and Daniel Nate, Nat. And, and I wanna apologize ahead of time in the event that I mispronounce anyone's name. Um, so those are the first three folks. Uh, Margaret McCourt uh, is not here at the moment. She's not feeling well. I beg your pardon? Uh, Margaret McCourt is not feeling well. Oh, okay. Um, so then Tamara Clements. And, and I would ask that before you begin that you just uh, repeat your name so that we make sure everything's meshing up front here. You ready? Yes. Okay. I'm not here to speak on Marcella's shale, right. and three minutes is not going to be enough uh, to justify the testimony that we submitted today on PPL's uh, poor corporate asset proposal. Um, and I would just suggest that folks go to our website at tmia.com. Um, our proposal has to deal with the uh, allocation of water to generate nuclear power plants. And although there were two significant events that happened this year in Pennsylvania regarding weather and Marcellus, um, I think people forgot there was also Fukushima. Um, I'm chairman of Three Mile Island Alert. We've been around since 1977. We monitor Peach Bottom 1, Peach Bottom 2, Peach Bottom 3, TMI 1, TMI 2, Susquehanna 1, Susquehanna 2. And it may have got past you that PPL is proposing a 1600 megawatt nuclear power plant for Bell Bend. Um, if you look at our testimony today, I'll be frank with you, it was like a man searching for a flashlight in a cave analyzing PPL's proposal. And I want to put your mind at ease. I'm not here to sue you today, um, <coughs> although I can't make any guarantees for PPL. Uh, we, th we think the proposal is fatally flawed. Um, I would really encourage you to look at our hydrologist's um, review of PPL's proposal. Um, we have a lot of concerns. One of the concerns I would draw you to is that their consumption uh, use proposal deals with 99.9% .9 coal and nuclear. I'm not really sure that's the direction the state is going right now. Um, the mitigation plan is woefully inadequate. And again, I would just register the concern that we've said in the past. I would reject fee and loo out of hand. I think we're at a point right now that the only way that you get water for taking water is water in a loo. And the fee in a loo, in my mind, should be a concept that we defeat and no longer explore. Water is a commodity. The world has changed. Politics have changed. When I used to come here, there was nobody here. Obviously, the atmosphere has changed for the better. Um, I would also, yeah, thank you. Uh, I would also point you to our testimony that we gave in January of 2010 from Artie Gunderson. We found that PPL's Bell Plant proposal is seriously flawed. I'm an active litigant in that case before the SRBC, um, and that has to do with consumptive <coughs> use, groundwater use. We're talking about a significant amount of water, a significant amount of water. Um, and <coughs> just to suggest that people in the audience, if you're interested in looking at the proposal that PPL has on the table, uh, which, by the way, is not one corporation, but 17 corporations, and it's basically a nuclear coal corporation, uh, and that's where the water's going. I encourage you to go to our website, tmia.com, um, or EFMR Monitoring. You will find the proposal evaluation by our staff hydrologists, and again, we were limited. There was no supporting documentation, so I'm not really sure how the SRBC gave the green light for this to move forward. And then if you go to our website, we also have the documentation from Arnie Gunderson, our staff nuclear engineer, on some of the faulty assumptions that PPL has proffered. Let me conclude by saying that we're not opposed to pooling. I think pooling has value. I really do. Uh, we're just opposed to this plan, which we believe is fatally flawed, and there's absolutely no supporting documentation to merit its moving forward. So at the end of the day, I'm not really sure how staff gave that recommendation. 
Uh, if I'm in under three minutes, that would be a first. Uh, I would also like to excuse myself. It's a session day in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's also FIA's board meeting day, and we have a suit against FIA regarding a $12.3 million fine. So no disrespect to anybody here, but I have to attend to other litigation in Harrisburg. Thank you. Okay. ATC. Yes, I'm here today because I uh, hear a lot about the flooding. I see on your your uh, sketches up there. The flooding seemed to be a big concern, but I think you had a total breakdown of the system. I didn't see any of the gauges working properly. They called for a flood stage to crest 27 feet. I lived at my house for 34 years. I know that was about the only six inches above the road. I could have took another foot or two, no problem. It was supposed to crest at 2 p.m. at 27 feet at 2 a.m. that night. I was out of my house. My house was flooded. It was about 30 feet. At about 14 inches in my house, enough the room to light. Your gauges didn't work. The system didn't work. Yes, you do need more taxpayers' money to address the issue of flooding. But you can't keep adding. You have a few dams, that's flood control dams. But you're trying to use flood control and you're filling the dams to full capacity because you're looking for extra storage for the gas industry and other industries. You cannot do this. You're gonna create a bigger flood than you just seen in history. You're gonna have a history flood and you are setting this up. But a dam has, could only have one master. You're either going to use the dam for flood control or you're going to try to make everybody happy. And this is what you're trying to do. And people are going to pay for it. You're going to have a worse flood than you had in six months. And you've got to remember, you said it over and over, one guy told you, gave the speech where he had the grass and it said, Specifically, you come into the drought season, which is a normal thing for Pennsylvania, in the June, July, August, September, but at the same time, in the southern Caribbean, off the coast of Africa, you're developing storms. And it's just about the same pattern together. I don't have a chart, but you chart it yourself. They parallel each other perfectly. <coughs> and just about the time, in the spring come, you're, you're holding three dams at Hammond, Tioga, and the other dam up there for flood control to the max to satisfy all the permitting that you're doing plus the other 26 permits. You are storing water in these dams at full capacity at the time the hurricane season is coming to the peak. Most dangerous time. We just got hit with it. You saw the results. And I'm saying right now, the next one will be sooner than people think. And it'll be worse than what they think. Thank you. God bless you. After Tamar, we'll have the Reverend Rick Phillips, Diane Sigmund, and Joan Schooley. Hi. Um, I bring you a letter from the Honorable Mayor of Betterton, Maryland. To the Susquehanna River Basin Committee. We here in Betterton, Maryland are committed to cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay by reducing nitrogen and phosphorus from our wastewater treatment discharge. We, we, it's on. Hello? We are committed to reducing the pollutants from other non-point sources. Our town, which is on the eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay, depends on clean, drinkable water for our health and welfare. The measures needed to control the pollutants, nitrogen and phosphorus, are expensive and present a major impact to our citizens, especially the efficient treatment of the wastewater. This is a huge problem we're dealing with now. We cannot handle any more damage to the already severely damaged Chesapeake. We insist you take into account that the effects of fracking is a regional problem rather than one isolated to the upper Susquehanna, and the damages done to our water, earth, and air is a public health issue. <laughs> the 
The wide and shallow mouth of the Susquehanna as it flows into the Chesapeake is visible from our side of the bay. This is already endangered, this already endangered river accounts for half of the water in our bay. The crabs, oysters, fish, and birds are just coming back from surviving the runoff pollution from years past. Working class people here depend on crabbing for their livelihood, not to mention our children swimming in the summer. <laughs> You must consider us. We are directly affected by what you do here today. Where are you going to dispose of this massive amount of flow back water from fracking? Your solution to be rid of it by dilution is not a solution we will tolerate. Our sewage plants do not have the capacity to treat those pollutants from fracking. And an environmental impact study is called for to study the effects of re-injecting this frac water into the earth allowing the natural gas drilling companies to take these 26 massive amounts from the source of our drinking water is a death warrant for the Susquehanna and the Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> By policy, you are to prevent, reduce, and eliminate water pollution. Access to clean water is a basic human right, especially so in our United States of America. Sincerely, Carolyn Sorge, mayor of the town of Betterton, Maryland. Actually, my name is the Reverend Leah Shade. Uh, Rick Phillips is with me, and I'm going to be reading a letter to the Susquehanna River Basin Commissioners from a group of interfaith clergy that are concerned about the 26 projects that are being submitted for approval. I am the pastor of United in Christ Lutheran Church in West Milton, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia. The, re the letter reads thus. First of all, thank you for your service to our region and its waterways. We honor your commitment to discerning what is best for the future of our precious country and the public good. We have signed this urgent letter to you as faith leaders throughout the region who are alarmed about the long-term public health and economic consequences of allowing the approval of 26 high volume slick water hydraulic fracturing projects along the Susquehanna River. The gas industry is lobbying to move forward quickly with plans for drilling throughout the Marcellus Shale, and industry reports claim that this method is safe. However, evidence from throughout the country where this method is being implemented presents a very different story. We cannot in good conscience allow this highly toxic method of extraction, which produces millions of gallons of radioactive and carcinogenic wastewater to further contaminate the drinking water supplies of our cities and communities. American rivers, designated the Susquehanna River the nation's most endangered river in 2011, largely due to increasing gas development and lax regulation. The EPA has also declared the Chesapeake Bay, which gets half of its fresh water from the Susquehanna, severely impaired by pollution and is requiring New York, Pennsylvania, and Maryland to reduce pollution loads. Approving these projects would mean the withdrawal of over 25 million gallons of water from the river per day and will contaminate groundwater with multiple toxins, including benzene, diesel, and lots of other things I can't even pronounce. We urge you to consider how your approval of gas development could contribute even more sediment and contaminants to the basin and not issue any more permits for projects that could make the pollution worse. In addition, our understanding is that the SRBC operates on the basis of joint authority, which requires policy coordination and uniform standards among member states when it comes to water use and management. The other two members, Maryland and New York, haven't yet decided to permit drilling. Thus, the only ethical course of action is to abandon these proposed regulations and not issue any more permits for water withdrawals until New York and Maryland have completed their studies of the impacts of gas development and adopted re re related regulations. Our children and grandchildren do not need natural gas to survive. But they, but they do need fresh water to drink and fresh air to breathe. Thank you very much, that's time.
And then on deck we have uh, Fred Murray, John Yamona, and Carol Ward. Uh, good morning, commission members. Um, Kelly, Madam Chairman, um, Diane Sigmund. I live in Bradford County. So some of the stuff that we're talking about and thinking about today uh, already has impacted where I live and how I live. Um, I think it's been nice to have the attention uh, brought before us as far as orange water in Pennsylvania, because basically what that tells me is that we haven't done a very good job in the past. Yes. I'm also really glad to hear that our our friends in the federal government, uh, in, tr in terms of an article I read yesterday, uh, President Obama has decided to look into better regulation of waste from uh, coal plants. So that's a step in the right direction. I hope the gas industry is next. I also want to say to you that what you do in terms of permitting water withdrawals is not as inert as you would perhaps think or like us to believe. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I'm a mental health pro professional, and I know that people are responsible for what they do. Uh, example, a, a state liquor store is not going to sell alcohol to minors. In <clears throat> Bradford County, in terms of meth labs, Kmart is careful how many jars or bottles of hydrogen peroxide they sell to people. And I would suggest to you in terms of lethal weapons, the Susquehanna has the potential of becoming a lethal weapon. Let me tell you what I mean. When the water is taken, and you know how it's gonna be used, you know you're permitting it to the gas company, to the gas industry, well what do they do with it? They pollute it. Then what happens to it? It kind of gets dumped sometimes on our roads. I drove home the other night, and I, there was a long trail of water on an otherwise dry road along Route 6 between Wyalusing and Tawanda. Somebody dumped something. I also want you to know that on dirt roads, I own a Geiger counter. Son of a gun, if they don't dump stuff on the dirt roads, and it registers for your information, twice background. So that's significant. That's something we need to look into. This is radioactive mess. They also are planning on spreading uh, distilled uh, water uh, residue from the uh, gas production on our roads in the form of salt and call it de-icer. Well, the stuff has heavy metals in it and the stuff has radioactive materials in it. So what you permit in terms of liability, basically I think, and I think we need to consider it in this manner, you're unleashing a lethal weapon. Hi, John Schooley, and um, the good Reverend pretty much took my thunder. I just want to be on the record for saying that all, all that's been mentioned is all that I'm concerned about. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Fred Murray. My name is Fred Murray. I live out in the back mountain. <laughs> In 1963, on Long Island, I caught a striped bass, and I got bit by it, and I get a reoccurring fever to go out and fish for these from then on. <laughs> this October, I got on the boat with my family and friends and went over to Nantucket Island. That was my 45th year. Every year since 1970, I went out there to do one thing, fish for striped bass and bluefish. I caught one bass, and it wasn't even a keeper. For over the years, we wondered what was taking place with the decline of the bass while Woods Hole stripped the eggs out of three 35-pound cow bass, and not one of those eggs would have hatched out. And you know why? Because of the herbicides and the pesticides in a place called the Chesapeake Bay. In 1985, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture allowed the farmers in this state to go to clear cropping. They put the herbicides and the pesticides on their fields. It went into the tributaries of the Susquehanna River. 
and destroyed the area where the main breeding ground of the striped bass took place. It did another thing. If you were a pheasant hunter and went down in a large cold called Dutch country years ago to hunt pheasants, you'd put up a hundred birds. Today you won't put out any. We have the third best population of pheasants in this country other than North Dakota and South Dakota. I belong to the anglers clubs on Long Island and they ran a contest by Schaefer Beer. You weighed in the striped bass that had to, you had to have, uh, not a picture of it, but you filled out a form with a witness. I won that three years in a row and there's the little pewter pen that I won, it has 68 on it. I weighed in 86 striped bass that qualified for that. We were blaming the Hall Saners, the Posey Bunch, better known as the Lander family from Amagansett. I saw them put a net off southeast of Morris Inlet. When they made that haul, 2,500 foot net, they couldn't move it because the purse was filled with striped bass. They cut that net open, threw them into their truck, put them in big boxes, ice, and shipped them down to the Fulton Fish Market and be one. It wasn't the water pollution. They're talking about the Marcella sale polluting that river over there. They're only right, but they're 35 years too late. Anyone in here ever pull a 35 pound striper out of the surf? That's, that, that's time, thank you, sir. I think if you don't get the point of what I'm saying, you know what, I'm going to call that Susquehanna River a sewer line and the Chesapeake Bay that destroyed the blue claw crabs. The people for generations that made their living dredging oysters is gone. Right. The Chesapeake Bay is a separate thing for that river. Don't like it. John Yamana. Thank you, Mr. Everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, as I have a soft voice. My name is Carol Ward, and I'm up here from Ardmore, which is only a few miles from Philadelphia. Um, I'm speaking as a member of the Retirees Local of District Council 47, White Collar Employees in Philadelphia. We have a thousand members, and those members are aware of what is going on now with the Marcellus Shale. And they're concerned. We're old, but we have grandchildren. And we have people that we want to have a future for. And so I'm just uh, very concerned about this. I believe that the effects of hydraulic fracturing are on collision course with human health and survival in many parts of the state. My understanding is uh, that the Susquehanna River Basin is, am I too close to the microphone? OK. Yeah. My understanding is that the Susquehanna River Basin Commission is considering approving these 26 massive water withdrawals. And I feel the way the previous speakers do about the severe danger of this. For example, uh, yes, we've gotten a lot of rainfall and flooding, but there is the danger of drought as well. And there's going to be increasing competition for water in the future, as we know, as the population expands. Uh, recently, there have been 400 days, I understand, of uncontrolled methane gas bubbling up in the Susquehanna. Can you still hear me? Okay. <laughs> Probably too much. Um, so this is something that uh, I was so shocked by reading because I've only been in this activism now for a couple of months. But uh, the only thing, and I'm agreeing with the other speakers, how can any water treatment facilities 
take out the impurities of these carcinogens, and do we really want to be drinking ethylene glycol in the morning when we have our coffee or tea? I mean, no. okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Theo Colburn is an acknowledged expert in the field um, and has identified potential health effects of chemicals that would be used in fracking, and she has studied the Western situation. 25% uh, of these are carcinogenic. Uh, we can't afford more cancer than we have now. With health costs and health care going down, how can we provide care for the people that may become ill from drinking this water? And I don't want to imply that I'm not grateful for the work of the commission because I have seen very dedicated people here. So it's a question of, of concerns about what's a priority here. Um, I, I really feel that we need to, to get back into trying to restrict our use of energy and to do something to, to rein in an unprincipled natural gas industry that doesn't care what happens to any of us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dean Marshall, and I'm a cross-addicted alcoholic. Oh, wait a minute, am I in the wrong meeting? Uh, no, I'm in the right meeting, because we are addicted. We're addicted to energy in this country. We're greedy for it. We're hogs for energy. Gas drilling energy companies are the same companies that brought us gasoline, motor oil, and heating oil, and pollution. And now they have a new trick to get the last little bit of fossil fuel out of the earth. That trick requires billions, even trillions of gallons of once fresh water. I thank the commission for its work too because there are issues with every industrial water use with you know, pollution from fertilizer runoff and, and natural events that this commission is, is doing their job to try to maintain the quality of the Susquehanna River Basin. But I find it ironic that back here on 11-16-2010, I got this bulletin from SRBC stating that uh, the SRBC encourages basin residents and businesses to continually conserve water. Water conservation for residential users includes repairing leaking toilets. <laughs> A leaking toilet can lose up to 200 gallons per day. <laughs> Repairing leaking and dripping faucets. A leaking faucet can lose up to 11 gallons per day. And it goes on about, you know, turning the water off while you're brushing your teeth or shaving. Now in reading the agenda for today's meeting and getting my calculator out the other night and adding up all of the 0.75 Oh, million gallon withdrawals here and 0 0.500 million gallon withdrawals there. I come up with 22 million 381,000 gallons per day that you're going to vote on today. Now that's not all the gas industry, there's other, other smaller you know, water suppliers that want to take this water. So I figure, to be fair, about 75% of that is for the gas industry. Over a year that's 8,169,000,000 65,000 gallons of water. Now the gas industry is going to take that water and poison it. We need to do something to stop the gas industry from using water to supply us with our energy addiction. Thank you. Good afternoon. The tide is turning. Gas drilling is becoming like the coal industry of Northeast Pennsylvania and the tobacco industry of the 1970s. Corporations once denied that their practices were causing health issues or environmental damage. But as time went on, their lies were exposed as scientific evidence proved the damage they denied. The gas industry is the, at the tip of the iceberg. We have listened for years that hydraulic fracturing is safe, yet day after day we see reports of groundwater contamination, well blowouts, pipeline explosions, 
spills, illegal dumping, and truck accidents. The cumulative effects of gas drilling will be a monumental challenge to clean up, just as coal mining continues to be a problem. Can we possibly clean up two environmental disasters at the same time? I don't think so. The toll the gas industry will take on the Susquehanna River will be enormous. 28 million gallons of water a day will, will end up being mixed with toxic chemicals and dumped into injection pits in Ohio and Arkansas, never to be released back to the ecosystem. There are no long-term studies on what pumping millions of gallons of toxic chemicals into the ground will do. Currently, studies are being done to determine if this injected water is causing earthquakes. Fracking has been linked to earthquakes in the United Kingdom. I lived by the Susquehanna River all my life and wondered if someday, if it would ever be clean enough to swim in or eat the fish I caught. As stewards of the river, it is your job to keep the river healthy for your children and my children and their children. 20 years from now, do you want to be remembered like the cigarette executives that knew smoking was dangerous but covered it up to make a buck? Do you want to be remembered like the coal barons of a century ago who didn't care what they were doing to the river would affect people for the next hundred years? You know the dangers of gas drilling. If you don't, you're not doing your job. Do the right thing to preserve the river for generations to come. I've also submitted a video for the commission as well. Thank you.